Say to the person next to you, you did well by coming to the house of the Lord. And tell them, you better pay attention because God is about to transform your life. Amen, amen. For the benefit of those who are joining us for the first time today, um, this month we are actually laboring on the theme, Outlive Yourself, right? Outlive Yourself. And to outlive yourself basically talks about you are made more than for now. And when you die, there's supposed to be something that carries on. God has put so much greatness in each and every single one of us as children of God. No one is created just to live have children, die, live, have children, die. As a child of God, each and every single one of us, we are called to change the world where we are in. And I'm just going to start off by borrowing, 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 yeah, borrowing from what Mam Funisi shared about a couple of weeks ago. She gave us five points on what to outlive yourself is. And point number one, she said, it is to live longer than yourself. In the book of Psalm chapter 90, verse 10, it says that our days are on earth are about 70 years. And if you are blessed with endurance, it's about 80 years. And obviously some people are living longer. But yeah, on average, God has given us 70 years on earth. So to live longer than yourself implies that you have to do something that when you die, they're still talking about you. It's not like died 2000 and then after that, no one talks about you. So as children of God, we have to outlive ourselves in the sense that when we die, our our works, our deeds, what we are talking about should still be echoing even after our death. Number two, she said, to outlive yourself is to give something that's lasting. To give something that's lasting. And it's not necessarily talking about money, but it could be talking about time. It could be talking about gifts. It could be talking about impartation. When I was young, uh, I grew up in a... Okay, when I grew up, my dad was not around, and you can imagine growing up with just your grand and my cousins. I was a bit messed up, didn't know what to be a man is supposed to be, frustrated, felt rejected, all those things. Until one day I went to church, and then a white couple, they saw me coming to church every Sunday, started taking an interest in me, cool, would go on picnics and all those things. And then when I, when I was going to stand at six, which is grade eight, then they decided to adopt me. So during the week, I'd go spend the Monday to Friday with them, and then weekends, I'd go to my parents, right? So in those five years, in those five years, I started learning about, actually, this is what fatherhood is supposed to be like. This is what uh, love is supposed to be like. This is what a family is supposed to be like. This is what giving is supposed to be like. Not because they were telling me, but I, I was seeing it, you see. So to outlive yourself, they gave something that was of eternal value, and it's not about money, okay? We need to also give out things that are going to impact the next generation. Even if it's mentoring a child one hour a week, you'll be surprised um, what that, that's going to do. Amen? Point number three, uh, Mam Fundisi said, to outlive yourself is to have a purpose that will last beyond your death. We look at Mandela. Mandela is no more, but you go to England, you go to America, even though people have never seen him, they're still talking about this great man even after his death. And that's what to outlive yourself is. Um, and the number four, she said, to make things better for the next generation. And I like this point. Um, in the book of Chronicles, you can write it down. We won't read it. Chronicles chapter 22, verse 6 to verse 14. We have David, King David. Now David is a man, or God says this about David. He is a man after my own heart. Imagine God saying that about you. He is a man after my own heart. He was a great king the greatest warrior, one of the greatest warriors in battle. And God lays it in his heart that, you know what? I want you to build me a tabernacle. Now, a tabernacle, instead of the Ark of the Covenant being carried around all the time, I want you to take the tabernacle and put the Ark of the Covenant there, and I'm going to dwell in that house. So David has it really impressed in his heart. And as he's trying to build, God says, no, 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 don't build it. You've got too much bloodshed. You fought so many battles, and I want my house to be pure. Actually, your son is going to do it. So it could have been easy for David to be like, okay, God, it's fine. I'll just leave it. My son is going to do it. But David realized that, you know what? If I'm going to make an impact in the next generation, I need to set up the next generation. So he started collecting money. He started collecting wood. He started collecting gold. And he got 150,000 people. He employed 150,000 people who were going to help his child. His child was Solomon. 
So Solomon was younger than 20, and when he started building the house of the Lord, he had all the things that he needed to build. Why? Because his family or his dad had already prepared all things. He just needed to monitor all things. So what are we doing as this generation? How are we setting up the next generation to succeed? Because as a young man, I got a car, my first car, 31. That's when I had my first car. But my child cannot have his first car at 35, right? So small things, and it's not about material things. It's about even education. What are we doing for the next generation? They can't regress. They can't start where we started. They need to have an advantage of, of things they are going to do. Amen? And point number four, number five, she said it is to step beyond impossible borders and to make a difference. To step beyond impossible borders and make a difference. Okay, so sometimes in life there are limitations. We think we can't do this because maybe I'm from a poor background. Or I can't do this because I'm a girl. Those things are done by boys. I can't do this because what, 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 right? And God says that to outlive yourself, you need to step out of those limitations. And sometimes things, they seem impossible until someone does it. And there's nothing that's impossible. The Bible says that all things are possible for those who believe. And if God is inside of you, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that you cannot accomplish. Amen? So that was just a recap from uh, what has been spoken about. And today, my sermon is going to be taken from the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 7 to verse 11. And we can turn there. Amen. As we turn there, I'm just reminded of this church. You know those churches where the pastor sings? Murena uh, Beluena. And then they reply singing, Amen. And then it was like, Arbuleng Bukaya, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 to verse 11. Amen. But now this man realizes, hey, shucks, this is the wrong verse. So he comes back. Hi, I see you now. You can rest the shorts. Ena kiona, amen. Kiona, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 to 11. Okay, and it reads as follows. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to, to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where, he, where they were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man named Atticus, who was sinking into deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke the bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. Amen. Okay, so this is the story of Atticus, a young man called Atticus. Um, the title of my sermon, as you can see, is called Get Off the Window. Everybody tell your neighbor, Get Off the Window. Get Off the Window. Amen. So a quick history. Paul is one of those uh, people who's like the pioneers of Christianity. He wrote over, he wrote the three-thirds, um, three quarters, sorry, three fourths uh, of the New Testament. He wrote to the Corinthians, Galatians, the book of Revelations was written by Paul. So he goes to this place called, um, sure, I forgot, sorry, never mind. He goes to this certain place, and then when he goes to this place, everyone is excited to see him. They gather in the hall, it's full, it's packed. They're like, yo, the Apostle Paul is coming. It's going to be lit, it's going to be dope. They are there, and it's full, right? It's there. But there's this young man called Eticus or Eutychus, depending which school you come from. So this young man, the Bible doesn't say the place was so packed, so packed that there was no seats. Yeah, but he decided to sit on a window, right? No, usually if you are the Bible, again, we just read, it said they are third, three stories up. Usually if you are up and back then they didn't have Ama Bagla like we have there, it was just like an open surface. In your right mind, no one is going to sit on a window. Amen? But this young man, he decided, I am going to sit on the window. The Bible says there were many lamps in that place. The Bible says also we are the light of the earth. 
So when the light, everyone is coming with the light, coming with the light. So when the light gathers here, there is a great revival. There is praise. Maybe you come, you are depressed, but because there's many lights here, you live out there. Oh yeah, no, I can do it. You know, maybe your heart was broken or you're going through stuff. Because you come to the house of the Lord, you ref, you you live being refreshed, right? So this man, his name is Atticus, and it means fortunate. And he's fortunate in a sense that he comes to the house of the Lord, but he's unfortunate because he decides to sit on a window. My first point, guys, as he comes to the house of the Lord, it is important to come to the house of the Lord and not just come to the house of the Lord, but to serve in the house of the Lord. You are not called to just come to the house of the Lord, sit, warm the chair, leave and go. Because if you are coming to the house of the Lord, two things and not serving. One, it's either you are denying us of the gift that God has placed inside of you. We are enjoying this wonderful conference because there's lighting guys, sound guys, there's the band, there's people who, who gave. Everyone is doing a part. And if you just come and you don't do your part, you know, you are denying us of another greater dimension. But number two, if you come into the house of the Lord and you're not serving, you are the first person who's going to find faults in everything, Amen. right? I'll be standing here, you'll be like, Ish, his face, he's facing back. I'm just seeing his back. Why did they put the stage like this? Ish, Mfundisi didn't see me today and I greeted him. What, what? You'll be the first person to complain. You again, Vision 2025. How many times must we give? What's happening in this church? Why? Because you are not serving and you don't understand the value of the house, right? And sometimes you actually don't have to do things uh, like actually two things. I gave an example. If you don't like cleaning toilets, instead of just saying, oh, I don't like cleaning toilets, how about you take, you go deep into your pocket, I'd leave yourself, pay someone to go and clean the toilets. We all have something we can contribute to the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And the Bible says that, David says, I was glad when they said, let us come to the house of the Lord. He says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He also says in Psalm 84 verse 10, Better is one day in your court, better is one day in your house than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell with sinners in their tents. And the Bible says in Hebrews 10 verse 25, Let us not give up meeting with one another as some of you are doing, but let us encourage one another. Amen. It is good to be in the house of the Lord, young people. Let me tell you, one of the things that has helped me to stay grounded is coming to the house of the Lord, serving in the house of the Lord. Because sometimes, if you're not serving, you'll wake up and you don't feel like going to church. That's, okay, maybe that's me. Maybe you guys are too holy for that. But yeah, don't feel like waking up. Like, ah, it's Sunday. Oh, I'm so tired. Youth first. I've been here. But because I know I'm serving, because I know there's people who need me, I go and serve. And usually those times you don't feel like coming to church, those are the days that God has a blessing for you. And you miss out a blessing because you're not coming to the house of the Lord, right? So this young man is seated on the window, right? And if we look at a window, a window is not outside, neither is it inside. It's not inside, neither is it outside. A window is in the middle. So what is this saying? This young man, he's here at the church, he's inside, I'm in church, He's just sitting there by the window. Hallelujah. They're playing. Yes, oh, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In the world. In the world. He's confused. What's going on? He comes inside. Goes outside. Gumnad. Heaven. So this young man, this is at a position spiritually where he's 50-50, right? He's in the church. He's also in the world. He's hearing the sermons, but he's also hearing Bob Babes or Doom, right? 50-50, best of both worlds, right? But because the Bible says that you cannot serve two masters, you need to choose one. Gradually over time, he starts listening to the world there, starts falling asleep. You know, as Paul, they're, they're preaching. Long, long, the church is going on. It's happening. But because he's on the window, he's also listening outside. by Mbiza and I, hey, come experience this. Come experience this. Eventually, he's sleeping, falling. And notice, when he fell to the ground, it wasn't an instant thing. It was a gradual thing. <laughs> he started falling asleep. Like, maybe, hey, wake up. 
hey. Next time, it's just like, one, two, hey. One, two, three, four, five, hey. Until one day, until eventually he fell. And yeah, he fell into the world. What is this saying to us? Where are you spiritually? Amen. Because this is a Christian. Where are you spiritually? We have people who are at the world, in, at church, but at the same time also at the world. Yes, you come here on Sunday when we lift up holy hands. You are the first to lift up. You're the first to run to the altar call. You're the first to cry. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Baba. He's here. He's here. First to cry. But the question is not what do you do on a Sunday. On a Monday, who are you? What we see you here on a Sunday, is it what's reflected? When people talk about you at work, do they say, yo, I know Ashley, I know Ashley's a Christian. Or do they say, hey, Ashley's a Christian. Ashley, <laughs> he goes to church. Hi, who's really not a kid? Hi, 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 hi. Huh? What do people say about you during the week? What are your works during the week? What are you doing to show that you're a child of God? You need to choose. You can't be in church and be in the world, right? Amen? The Bible says that um, God hates people who are lukewarm. If you read the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 14, God himself says, he gives a revelation to Paul. He says, I wish, oh, we can read it, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, Right? These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. This is what God is saying. And guys, when God says, I'm about to spit you out. You don't spit out something that's nice. Like, who? Grape ties are A.M. Nandi. Hey, grass taste. <laughs> Apple tree taste is nice. Spit out. Right? You spit out something that is disgusting because you don't want it in your mouth. So God is giving that analogy. If you are a lukewarm person, he is going to spit you out. And, you know, we might be fine coming to church and we think we're still fine. But the Bible says also in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, on that day, which day? Judgment day. Many, not few, many, many Christians will go to God and God will be like, okay, one right heaven, left hell, right? And all of a sudden, the Christians left. And you'll be shocked who's going that side, right? Because at church, yeah, everyone looks holy. Everyone is lifting holy hands. But God sees your heart. You cannot fool God, right? And then the people on the left going to hell will be like, but God, God, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not raise the dead in your name? Did we not heal the sick in your name? And God is going to be like, depart from me, you wicked servant. And this is a person who's lukewarm. Depart from me, you wicked servant, for I didn't know you. In other words, you didn't have a relationship with God. You were just there, both left, right, you are there, right? God hates lukewarm. And David says to the children of Israel when he's about to depart, he says that, guys, choose for yourself who you want to serve. If Baal is God, then serve Baal. If God is God, then serve God. Right? Don't mix God with the ancestors. Don't mix God with money. Choose for yourself who you want to serve. It's a choice that you make. No one forces you to choose. It's a choice that you make. Choose for yourself. And he says, but as for me and my house, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, so God hates lukewarm. And you know what? I always say, or not always say, but I always think about it. The Bible says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. So we are living in a time where we are getting attacked left and right. The politics are attacking us and all those things. Uh, people are being persecuted for their faith. And God says that nothing ever is going to prevail from the church. The church will always be victorious. The church will always be conquerors. But I believe there's one thing that can destroy the church, and it's us as Christians because we are lukewarm, right? We are lukewarm. When we are lukewarm, we can destroy the church. I remember at school, when I grew up in high school, there was this other guy who's also a Christian. 
Uh, he was sold out. We came. Hey, are you Christian? Cool. Ah, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Talk, talk, talk. And then he met this other guy called Ashley. Not this Ashley. The other Ashley. Okay? So he met Ashley. And Ashley was very clear about his stand. He was not a Christian. He was just living his life. And I appreciated that about him because he was honest. Right? But slowly Ashley started luring this boy who's a Christian. Ganyan in grade 8. How? All of a sudden he just drinks ciders. Like, Eban, okay, it's just sad. Hey, Ashley, the Bible says don't get drunk. It doesn't say don't drink. Right? <laughs> like, none, none, none. You see, small convictions. Little by little, you're falling asleep, right? And before you know it, by the time he was in grade 10 or uh, matric, grade 12, in relationships left and right, uh, sexual immorality, and I'm not judging, I'm just using it as an example, right? Sexual immorality, when they were going clubbing, he's also there. And now his friends, they come to me one day and they're like, hey, Ashley, come, let's go clubbing. I'm like, no, no, I can't do that. I'm a child of God. I don't believe in that. Ah, don't be like that, man. Look at this guy. He's also a Christian and he does the thing that you are doing. You know? So what's happening now? That Christian is sitting on the window. And the thing is, if you are sitting on the window, the people outside are supposed, in fact, through the window, you're supposed to see like what's happening, right? And if the window is clear, they're supposed to hear, hey man, there's, there's, a, there's a noise that's happening there. There's a nice noise. Hey, these people sound like yeah, something is, yeah. But because he's sitting on a window, he's lukewarm. He's blocking the people from seeing inside. This other Christian friend of mine, right? He's blocking the people from receiving salvation, seeing the colors of God. That's one. Number two, another guy also uh, came to me. He's like, ay, 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 you know what? I don't want this God of, oh, actually, I'm not going to be a Christian. Like, look at your friend. He's a Christian. He goes to church. You know what? I'm actually better than him because I chill at home and I just pray to God. And God, you know, God is a loving God. He forgives. Uh, yeah, those things. So he's blocking people from, when we're lukewarm, we're blocking people from receiving salvation. And the Bible is very clear. Jesus says that to the lukewarm people, whoever makes any little one to fall, so any little person in faith, if you're still growing up in faith, if you cause someone to stumble, ne, he says it's better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and you be thrown in the middle of the ocean. So a millstone is like, uh, it's a heavy rock, something that's heavy. So he's saying it's better for you to be tied with that thing and then they throw you in the middle of the ocean and you just drown and you die than to make someone stumble. That's how serious God is about uh, as make, not making people to fall. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Uh, number four, the Bible says that Paul talked on and on, and this guy, he fell deep into sleep as Paul is talking. Okay. So when we fall deep into sleep, it's a sign of us falling from the faith. Like I said, we don't just fall automatically or immediately. Gangan, gangan, right? It's like the story of Samson. We all know Samson was the strong, well, he, he was strong when God came upon him. When God came upon him, he'd do crazy things that no one has ever done. He would go, there would be a thousand men trained for war with guns and all those things, and he'd just take a jaw of a, uh, jawbone of a donkey. Imagine one man, shy a thousand men, and he'd kill them, right? That's how powerful God was using him. And the very power that God gave him, he started misusing it. Then he started, because he was supposed to deliver the children of Israel from the Philistines and all the other enemies, and he started sleeping with the, with the, with the children, um, with the Philistines and the enemies. Then he started sleeping with the prostitutes. Then came Delilah, right? And with Delilah, one beggar go pee? Here, on the tang, right? One beggar on the tang. Um, Mara Samson, what, what is your strength, eh? Why are you so strong? <laughs> I'm <on Delilah. laughs> you know, if you tie me with seven cords, uh, ah, no, 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 yeah, then they'll overpower me, Delilah. Oh, okay, CMC. <laughs> okay? And then when he was sleeping, tested him. And then, hey, Samson, the Philistines are coming. Where are they? Okay, he's still good, still good. <laughs> Delilah is frustrated. Mara Samson, what's your name? Mara Samson, Mara Samson. Wena, wena. What, is, what is the secret of your... You're so strong, man. You're so strong. What is the secret of your strength? Ah, no. If you tie me with seven brand new robes, ah, I'm telling you, I become weak as a baby. Ah, I hope I'll tell you something. No, I can't. I can't. Okay. Falls asleep, same thing. 
same sin, same sin. The Philistines are coming. Whoop. Right? He becomes free eventually because he's flirting with sin. Right? You cannot flirt with sin and think it's just going to, you'll flirt forever. There comes a point in time where it's going to give, it's always going to give some. The Bible, whatever you feed, that thing grows. If you feed your ignorance, you are going to be more ignorant. If you feed your spirit, man, you are going to be stronger spiritually, right? If you feed the desires of your flesh, the wrong desires of your flesh, you are going to uh, yield from that. Eventually, guess what? They get him, right? Let me get, let me get two young girls. At each second service, it backfired. I asked for, yes, let me get these two. I asked for guys and they just couldn't get it. Vunene? I'm sure, I'm sure. As we just model up here, as hallelujah. Is a ramp, is a ramp. Just want, want to show you something. As they are wearing their uniform in celebration of June 16. <laughs> this is what happens with sin. Just hold here. I'm going to stand in front so they can see the camera. So when you are flirting with sin, this represents bondage, right? Bondage is something that's very, yeah, dirty. It weighs you down. It doesn't make you free. And you come to church, you're still fine. You're still serving the Lord. You're still smiling. Just lock me in here. Make sure it's tight. No, no, not there. Yeah, so I can't escape. Yeah, but don't kill my blood. There we go. Just lock. Right? So you come to church. We are lukewarm. We hear the word. We hear the word and all is good. Just push it in, girl. Yay. There we go. Bondage. We're sitting, ah, it's okay. Hey, as long as the pastor doesn't see me, I'm fine. You know, hey, as long as Abbas are learning, they don't see me. And you see the pastor, hallelujah, I'm from this. <laughs> good, we're good. But you know, behind closed doors at work, you're not living the right life. The devil gets you. He's binding you. But you don't feel it immediately. Remember, he's progressive. He's, if there's one thing I love about the devil, the one thing that we can learn from him, he's very patient. Yeah. Very patient. He doesn't mind taking his time. He's got all the time in the world because he knows he's going to bend for eternity. So he's very patient, right? Ah, hallelujah, you come to church, hallelujah. It's work, it's work, it's work, it's work, it's work, right? <laughs> you start doing other things as well. You're not living the right life, but you come to church, you even tithe and all those things. Just make sure it's tight. I can't get out. You're just living your life, best of both worlds. When they read, when they say amen, you say amen. Okay, thank you. You may sit down. Thank you. Hallelujah. Give them a round of applause, please. When they say amen, you say amen. Until one day, the devil's got you so tied up. So tied up, you can't come out. And then you come to church. Let's lift up holy hands and pray. And the devil's like, sorry? You are lifting up what? Your hands. You say you love Jesus. Maybe you love Sipo. Because you were busy with Sipo yesterday. Not Jesus. He starts reminding you of your sin. Why? Look warm. They talk about offering. You try to get your offer. You can't. Even. You can't do anything. Because you are bound by sin. Whatever you feed grows. Whatever you feed grows. And if we are at that point, Bazalano, where we are being lukewarm, we just need to come back to God. And he's going to free us completely. Amen. He is going to give us a second chance and restore. <laughs> Hallelujah. The Bible says when he was sound asleep, he fell three stories. Now three stories, the number three represents Trinity. It represents, for me, deity, God. You know, God is three parts. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Jesus, when he was on earth, his best friends, there were three. Simon, Peter, James, and John. As human beings, we are tripartite beings. Uh, soul, body, and spirit. We know about the heavens. There's three heavens. There's the atmosphere, there's the heaven out of space, and then there's the heaven, heaven, heaven. All right? Three represents spirituality in the Bible when we deal with numbers. So number three, he was three stories, and then he fell. The question is, where are you spiritually? Where are you spiritually? Let's look at your spirit. When was the last time you actually prayed? And not praying, God, uh, bless my family. Or oh, not praying for the food we are about to receive. May the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. God bless our food. 
When was the last time you, you really prayed? Right? Because praying is talking to God. Like now, this is praying. You are listening, I'm talking. Right? That's praying. When was the last time you prayed? When was the last time you actually got a revelation from the Bible for yourself? Not from the pastor. Not from me. When was the last time you got a revelation for yourself from the Bible? Because if you're not getting anything, check your spirituality. You might just be lukewarm. You're coming to church, you're listening, but actually you are not there. Right? God has got enough revelations for every single one of us. We are not living in the Old Testament where it's only the pastor and the king who can hear from God and then they have to come call us and tell us what God says. Okay? Because some people are trying to go back there. That's why they, you get other pastors feeding them other sorts, all sorts of things. Snakes. And you know, you know, snakes, okay, I'll eat. Grass, I'll eat. Why? Because you're depending on the pastor's revelation instead of your own revelation. When was the last time you fasted, Mzalwan? Hmm? Because the Bible talks about the three in Matthew chapter 6. It says, uh, when you give, when you pray, when you fast. When was, when was the last time you gave, really gave? When was the last time you fasted? When was the last time you prayed? These are some of the things that you need to check. Ask yourself, am I doing this? Because if you're not, chances are you are sitting there on that window. And you might be at the end stage. You might just be starting to sit. So it helps to understand where you are. Amen. The Bible talks about, uh, in the Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 to 23, it's the parable of seeds. The parable of seeds. So a farmer is there, he's busy sowing seeds, planting seeds, he's just throwing, 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 throwing seeds. And as he's throwing, some of the seeds, they fall on the pathway, just a normal pathway. And after some time, or immediately after that, the birds, they come, they eat that seed. You know what the seed is? The seed is the word of God. You know, if the devil, the devil is not after you, I'm too suicidal. Can I tell you that? You don't scare the devil. The devil doesn't even care about you. He's not afraid of you, but he's afraid of the word that is inside of you. Right? Because it's the word that can change you. It's the word that can heal you. It's the word that can free you. It's the word that can destroy him. It's the word, and we know that the word is God as well. Right? He's afraid of the word. So the seed, they fell on the rock, on the rock. And on the rock, as they fell there on the pathway, rather, the birds came, they ate it up. Are you coming to church? And when you come to church, ha, huh, nothing happened. You come to church, uh, you, don't, you don't even listen. What's going on? Mara, you are there. Habari, Ashley? Okay, Tik, he was here. But you didn't hear anything. Right? That's the first one. The second one, then the seeds, they fell on soil that there was by the rocks. But because it was by the rocks, when it grew up, it got choked quickly. Right? The third one, the seed fell among the thorns. And obviously, as it grows up, falling among the thorns, then the thorns started choking it and it died. And the fourth one fell among the good soil. Let me bring it closer to home because I can see people are looking at me like... Which seed are you? Four different types of Christians that we have here. Number one, the seed that fell on the thorns. On the, on the road, and the seed came. You come to church, this is the word of God. The word is preached, and we're supposed to actually contain the word inside of us, and the devil, remember I said, the devil tries to steal the word. But because your heart is hard, you don't want to hear, I just want to see what's happening. Just hear about hope restoration. There's a lot of cars outside. I want to see what's there, what's happening, these Christians. And yeah, maybe you even come, maybe you're a journalist, you want to write an article, hey, this pastor is asking people for money, what, 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 he's driving big cars. Maybe that's you. The word gets poured, but immediately bounces off because you're not ready to receive the word. Are you that kind of a Christian? Christian number two, you come to church, you love God, and the word gets shared, you receive the word, but as soon as tough times come, we have wuza, Mzalwan. We have wuza. The word doesn't last long. We have wuza. Yangena, in here, out here. You know the verses, but we have wuza. We have wuza. You are just leaking, right? You're not keeping the word. The third type of Christian, you hear the word, you keep it, you believe, and all those things. But as soon as tough times come, you know what? Your word gets swallowed up. I've heard of people saying, 
If God takes away my father, I will stop believing in God. Right? And it's true. If God does not give me the car, I will stop believing. If God does not give me a husband, I will get myself a husband. I'm not going to believe in this weight upon the Lord nonsense because it's not happening anymore. Right? <laughs> These are the kind of Christians, as soon as tough time comes, you are very quick to go out. Well, you just want God for the open fridge. Hey, when there's milk, hey, hallelujah, God my provider. Right? But when it's time for God to show that he's indeed your provider, when you open that fridge and there's nothing, instead of saying, God, you know what? I trust in you. I believe you will provide for me. You just say, no, 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 you're not my provider. Let me go find myself a blesser. Let me go do something else. This is the wrong kind of Fell Christian. Amen. From the three stories. Then, all of a sudden, they woke up. All of a sudden, Paul goes out. They entertain the young person who's now dead. But Zalane, we cannot wait for people to die in order for us to try and resurrect them. We cannot wait for the society to start killing each other for all these wrong things to start happening before we're like, hey, Konja, by the way, we are the church. We've got the power. Let's do this, right? We need to actually, my question is, when the young man is sitting there at the back, wasn't there anyone, any old person who's like, hey, Mfana, come out. Hey, that's, that's not right, you know? Wasn't there anyone in the right state just to call that young person? And nowadays, that's why we're also having teenage pregnancies and our children by our school. Why? Because we see them and we just take a back seat. And, hey, Mfundis, hey, yeah, he's a youth, he's man. Hey. But when the child is standing there at the corner with a boy or with a girl, we don't say anything. We just pass as though nothing is happening. Why are we keeping quiet? God gave us a voice. We are the poles of this earth and we're supposed to be doing something. When there's corruption, why are we quiet? When we see wrong things, why are we quiet, guys? We are there to change the world. You see, the Bible, like most of the time, we expect the pastor to be the one who's winning souls, to be the one who's bringing people. But if you look at the tribes, there were 12 tribes of Israel, right? And only one tribe out of all the 12, only one tribe was dedicated to working in the house of the Lord, which is the Levites. So it says... Yes, there will be a few of us who work at church, like Bo Ashley full-time and Mruti full-time, but the rest of us, we're not supposed to leave the work to us who are working at church. Supposed to come to church, receive the word, you are equipped, you go to your, way, to your world. No matter how much the pastor tries, the pastor we know is very passionate about people, but no matter how hard he tries, there's certain people he can never reach. Why? Because they are out of his world. He maybe cannot reach people at Sasa or at the accounting firm because it doesn't work there. Right, Sasa? Yeah. But when I'm Zalate, you are working there and those people, you're supposed to reach out for them. Full-time ministry is not for people working at the church. Full-time ministry is for all the Christians. Wherever you are, you are supposed to be making a difference. Winning people over to Christ, bringing solutions. Don't be a headache, part of the headache, but be part of the people who are making a difference. Because God says, go ye all to the earth all to the ends of the earth, baptizing everyone in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and making disciples. The call to make disciples is not for people who are working at church. All of us are supposed to be making disciples. So I want to ask you, where are you? Are you on the window or are you inside? Choose for yourself. No one's going to choose for you. God, I always say, I like saying, God does not have grandchildren. Right? We know, we only know of the children of God, but some of us are like, ah, we are grandchildren. How? Hi, my father is a pastor, so I guess I'm also saved. Oh, my mother prays a lot, and I also, I'm also saved. No, no, you are a grandchild, and God does not have grandchildren. God only has children. So, Bazalan, in closing, let us get off the window because the world is waiting for us. Let us choose God, guys, and let us be passionate. Young people, choose God, go out there full force. None of this left, right, both feet in the world. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Encourage this young man, man. Come on, show some appreciation, man. Show some appreciation. Well done, Ashley. First time on this pulpit, and he did well, man. May the good God bless you, young man. I pray.